Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. The chemistry between John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara on screen and their close bond behind the camera led many to believe that the two legendary actors were actually a couple. But were they? Although they were never married, John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara had their own version of a love affair, keeping up a strong friendship throughout their careers. Did Maureen O'Hara and John Wayne have a secret affair? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Her most famous film was The Quiet Man, but Maureen O'Hara was anything but quiet. She was a feisty, colourful, energetic, talented, no-nonsense woman who mesmerised Hollywood and made her own rules. In 1939, an Irish miss of 18 landed in Hollywood, not knowing what to expect. Her education came swiftly as she was thrust into stardom with her first movie and became a pawn in the big studio system. With her vibrant red hair and rich green eyes, it seems like Maureen O'Hara was born to become the biggest star in old Hollywood. After all, she was known as the Queen of Technicolor. But behind the scenes, things weren't always so bright for O'Hara. From a secret marriage to onset feuds, darkness chased O'Hara throughout her career, but the fiery Irish actress always outran it. Before she was the Queen of Technicolor, she was Maureen Fitzsimmons. As one of the six Fitzsimmons children in 1920s Dublin, things were never boring in Maureen's household. As Maureen herself said, her family was the most remarkable and eccentric family I could have possibly hoped for. Her mother had been an operatic contralto and her father was involved in the clothing industry. O'Hara was born into an interesting moment in Irish history, in the middle of the War of Independence, and with the Civil War looming, the nation was painfully defining itself. The proclamation of the Irish Republic in 1916 had promised civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and throughout her life O'Hara was determined to seize those opportunities. An active, physically capable child, she earned the nickname Baby Elephant and enjoyed football, swimming in the River Dodder and horse riding. The only red-haired child in the family, she stood out in childhood in a manner that made her self-conscious when adolescence struck. However, she had a dogged streak that she cultivated. I didn't take discipline very well. I would never be slapped in school. If a teacher had slapped me, I would have bitten her. I guess I was a bold, bad child, but it was exciting. Involved in amateur dramatics in Rathmines from the age of ten, she had set upon a life on the stage with the tenacity that was to become her trademark. At the Abbey Theatre she began her theatrical career by painting sets. She then studied at the Guildhall School of Music in London, becoming their youngest ever graduate in 1936. Maureen was greatly influenced by her parents, particularly her father. Charles Fitzsimmons was in the clothing business, and he had an interest in Shamrock Rovers, leading Maureen to become a lifelong supporter. As a child, she never missed a match and even worked in the grounds as a cleaner. Later, she was instrumental in bringing Shamrock Rovers to Hollywood in 1967, where they participated in a US soccer season. Maureen was equally obsessed with acting and singing. She had a beautiful singing voice which she inherited from her mother, Marguerite, a former operatic contralto. She joined the Rathbines Theatre Company at the age of 10 and started appearing in amateur productions. She was good and soon managed to get an audition for the Abbey. She landed a part in The Merchant of Venice at only 15 years of age and began to be noticed by the critics. Maureen spent a couple of years at the Abbey before a visiting American actor-singer by the name of Harry Richman saw her and invited her to accompany him to England, where he was headed for a screen test. Her mother agreed to allow her to go on condition that she came too, so Maureen and Marguerite appeared at Elstree Studios. Despite her stilted performance due to nerves and discomfort caused by the heavy makeup and elaborate costume, Charles Lawton saw the screen test and was struck by O'Hara's expressive features. Lawton would be instrumental in the development of O'Hara's career, insisting on changing her name to the shorter O'Hara after her breakthrough role in Hitchcock's Jamaica Inn in 1939. 
O'Hara objected, but eventually relented. She would star opposite Lawton in The Hunchback of Notre Dame again in 1939, a role which garnered much positive attention, although her contribution is sometimes somewhat diminished by the praise heaped on Lawton for his physical transformation. When Lawton then offered her the part of Esmeralda in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, she jumped at the opportunity and never looked back. Just before leaving for Hollywood, she secretly married British producer George H. Brown, whom she met on the set of Jamaica Inn. He stayed behind in London. The marriage was annulled the following year. She travelled to Hollywood with her mother and started working for RKO Pictures on Hunchback. Again, she received amazing reviews. However, Lawton then sold her contract to RKO. She felt abandoned as she began making mediocre movies which did not interest her. She was about to give up on Hollywood, break her contract and return to the Abbey when John Ford cast her in How Green Was My Valley and her career changed forever. It began a long and turbulent relationship with the director that would see her act in five of his movies. Again, she received superb reviews which encouraged her to stay on in Hollywood. During this period, she met and married the director Will Price. He was a chronic alcoholic and their marriage was deeply unhappy. Although she did have a daughter, her only child, Bronwyn. Maureen and Price divorced after 10 years. Nevertheless, her film career began to soar. Throughout the 1940s, she appeared in a string of hit movies and worked with some of the greatest directors and leading men of all time, developing a particularly enduring collaboration with John Wayne. She became renowned for her beauty and fiery temper and was dubbed the Queen of Technicolor, which Maureen hated as she felt it demeaned her acting abilities and focused only on her looks. Her career continued to go from strength to strength and by 1946 she decided to become a naturalised citizen of the United States. However, there was a problem. After passing through the process, she was asked to forswear her allegiance to Great Britain. She refused with the words, I am Irish, I will not forswear allegiance to Great Britain because I owe no allegiance to Great Britain. I was born in Dublin, Ireland. I am Irish and my allegiance is to Ireland. O'Hara's career suffered after the breakout of the Second World War. She begged her agent to get her a role. Playing the role of Ang Harrod allowed her to flex her dramatic muscles and was the beginning of a 20-year collaboration with Ford. Their relationship was not without its challenges. Adrian Fraser, in his book Hollywood Irish, documented O'Hara's testimony of the moment where Ford punched her in view of a number of colleagues. I felt my head snap back and heard the gasps of everyone there. In 1950, the two would work together again on Rio Grande, this time with John Wayne, who would become one of Maureen's firmest friends, collaborating with her on five films. In later life, he said of her, She's a great guy. I've had many friends and I prefer the company of men, except for Maureen O'Hara. Rio Grande was one of a number of adventure films that allowed O'Hara to play the, often stereotypical, fiery redhead. The Black Sails, Sinbad the Sailor, Flame of Araby and At Swords Point all cast her in action roles, either as an exotic princess or a feisty cowgirl. Of Comanche Territory in 1950, New York Times critic Bosley Crowther said, she tackles her assignment with so much relish that the rest of the cast, even the Indians, are completely subdued. These action roles were often dictated by the demands of her contract and meant that she was deemed a little stiff and humourless in dramatic roles. The opportunity to really demonstrate her range came in 1952's The Quiet Man, again with Ford and Wayne. The role of Mary Kate was complex, demanding that the actor portray a changeable, volatile, physically expressive woman who is subdued by love, a role reminiscent in some ways of Kate in The Taming of the Shrew. As such, it can be troubling to the modern viewer, but O'Hara tackled the role with passion and aplomb, while reaffirming her expert comic timing. John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara had an on-screen chemistry and off-screen friendship rarely seen in Hollywood, while the pair were never married, they did star in five films together and brought us some of the big screen's greatest love stories. In The Quiet Man, their on-screen chemistry was so strong it made the film an instant classic. They were just as passionate friends off-screen, 
though it never strayed into an affair as some claimed. John Wayne has married three times and his difficulty in remaining faithful has been known to many audiences. It was no surprise when many fans believed, even hoped for, that his on-screen love story with Maureen O'Hara continued behind the camera. Well, sorry to disappoint, but they did not. It was something O'Hara and Wayne have consistently denied in many interviews over the years. In 2000, O'Hara graced the Larry King live show where she answered questions about the Duke. The actress revealed that Wayne described her as one hell of a guy, which she has always considered a compliment. She also revealed that her husband, Charles F. Blair, was even good friends with Wayne for many years. Blair enjoyed playing chess with the actor, who would frequently visit their home. John Wayne's respect for Maureen O'Hara is beyond evident, and he often demonstrated it through his own words. She has been his wife several times, but a fighting partner in many cases. Still, Wayne argued that there's no way you can make O'Hara not look beautiful. The legendary director John Ford even tried to make her unattractive in a few scenes, and it was impossible, Wayne said. In 1979, Maureen O'Hara had flown in to speak before the House Banking, Finance and Urban Affairs Subcommittee on Consumer Affairs for a bittersweet mission. Her eyes were filled with tears knowing that her dearest friend for 39 years was gravely ill. Still, she gathered all her courage and, in an emotionally riveting moment, gave her testimony for the President of the United States' approval to strike a commemorative gold medal in John Wayne's honour. But some say that the actor had a three-year affair with Marlena Dietrich, but his romance with his friend and co-star Maureen O'Hara lasted even longer. Still, Wayne's close friend confirmed that the duo had a long affair before and during the actor's marriage to his third wife, Pilar Pellet. His friend also said that the quiet man stars often met at Wayne's ranch in Arizona. Wayne's son Michael stated that O'Hara was the only woman who could match his father kiss for kiss, punch for punch, stride for stride. He shared that she was the one who could go toe to toe with his father. The real life mystery of what Maureen O'Hara whispered to make John Wayne look so shocked. The set of The Quiet Man was the scene for one of the great secrets of the golden age of Hollywood and Maureen O'Hara was one of only three people to have known the truth. It involved a famous scene at the end of the iconic 1952 movie. In the scene, Maureen O'Hara's character, Mary Kate Danaher, is stood outside by a stream with her husband, Sean Thornton, who was played by John Wayne. They were waving goodbye to Micheline Ogiflin, who had helped them to pursue their blossoming romance. Mary Kate then turns to Sean and whispers something in his ear. What she says is inaudible as the soundtrack is playing over the action. Sean is taken aback and Mary Kate turns to run back to the cottage with Sean chasing shortly after. Initially she refused to say the mystery words, writing in her memoir years later, I couldn't possibly say that to Duke. However, Ford insisted that she do it so as to get the genuinely shocked reaction from her co-star, which totally worked. What Maureen O'Hara whispered to John Wayne in the scene is a secret that the stars have both taken to the grave. What we do know is that director John Ford wanted to capture a genuine reaction from Wayne and asked O'Hara to whisper something extremely suggestive as the scene was playing out. It was something considered risque in the early 1950s. Of course, this scene and the final cut almost didn't end up in the movie until Ford pushed for the final cut in his usual uncompromising manner. O'Hara once said, It was something very rude, and John Ford insisted I say it. I said I didn't want to, and he said, I'm telling you, you're doing it, you must do it. So the agreement was that neither Duke, nor I, nor John Ford would ever, ever, ever tell what I said. O'Hara, Wayne and Ford have all passed away, and none of them ever revealed what was whispered by O'Hara to make Wayne look so shocked. It seems like we will never know, which is perhaps how it should be. However, fans will probably never tire of speculating, which adds another layer of intrigue to the classic film. Maureen O'Hara was more than just a brilliant actress. She was also a singer, a businesswoman and a champion of women's rights. 
She was the first Irish person to retain Irish citizenship after becoming an American citizen. She was one of the first actresses to bring a libel action against a tabloid, and she was the first to win. She was the first woman to be a president and CEO of a scheduled airline in the US, and she was the first Irish Hollywood superstar. She was a survivor in a difficult world where the casting couch prevailed and powerful men made all the decisions. Maureen would not submit to their demands. If she were alive today, she'd be on the front line, offering incendiary sound bites and kicking the establishment in the behind. O'Hara worked steadily until her retirement in 1971, returning occasionally to film in later life. She became one of the Technicolor era's most loquacious and witty chroniclers in her memoir, Tis Herself, published in 2004, a compelling read that lifts the lid on much of the sleaze and scandal of Hollywood and demonstrates the metal its women stars had to possess to survive in the industry. Proud to define herself through her Irish identity to the last, she wrote in her memoir, Being an Irish woman means many things to me. An Irish woman is strong and feisty. She has guts and stands up for what she believes in. She's not above a sock in the jaw if you have it coming. She retired to Glengariff, but as age took its toll, she returned to the States, where she lived with Connor in Boise, Idaho. She passed away in 2015 at the age of 95, one of the last remaining stars of the golden age of Hollywood. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. What was between Maureen O'Hara and John Wayne still remains a mystery, but if you want to know how Gail Russell destroyed John Wayne's marriage, click this video.